My name is Melvin Wade. I'm director of the Multicultural Center. And we are the sponsors, one of the sponsors of tonight's event, uh, which is capping the first day of URI Diversity Week. I would like to acknowledge the other sponsors, among them Lifespan, MedLife, Auto, and Home, the College of Human Sciences and Services, which this year is the second academic college to do a day of diversity week. Uh, Wednesday will be their day. The Student Entertainment Committee and the Office of Community Diversity and Equity. Tonight's program uh, is the 15th annual Diversity Week. And on this occasion of the 15th, I'd like to share with you a bit about how Diversity Week has changed over the years. When Diversity Week was initiated, the objective of Diversity Week was to address issues of campus climate. And now we have become much more ambitious. And we believe that the role of Diversity Week is to prepare us as an academic community for all of the dramatic changes that will take place here in the 21st century. Our speaker tonight is, in some sense, a dramatic exponent of those changes. For one uh, point, our speaker is a futurist, and it is important for each of us who are present tonight to understand the role that the future plays in guiding our own destiny. It is so easy to be passive about the future. And what we're saying is that the changes here in the 21st century are so dramatic that it is important for us to take charge of this era. The second point that we'd like to make is one of those changes has a lot to do with the transition to a knowledge economy. That is an economy where the challenge to each one of us will be to learn how to disseminate, how to gather, how to analyze, how to store knowledge. Dr. Kaku refers to this as intellectual capital. And so part of the challenge to each one of us here today is how to gather enough intellectual capital so that we're relevant for the future. At this time, I would like to bring forward the Dean of the College of Environment and Life Sciences, who will introduce our speaker for the evening. Would you welcome Dean John Kirby from the College of Environment and Life Sciences. John was the first dean to, uh, to embrace Diversity Week through his academic college. And I'm grateful to him. So would you give him a round of applause? Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Melvin. When we think about diversity, we often think about 
where people are from, what people look like, what their beliefs are. But when you really embrace in the university environment, diversity has to include that full intellectual range, that whole span of who individuals are and how do we bring people together who have different perspective, different views, and different goals. So it is, a great, it is my great pleasure today to introduce Professor Michio Kaku, who is going to discuss and to, bring, to make you think about some of the opportunities for the future. Professor Kaku is the Henry Semet Professor of Theoretical Physics at the City College of New York. He is a theoretical physicist who has studied, among other things, string field theory. Those of you who are not mathematically inclined, that's one of those fields with big, long equations. He just informed me that New York Magazine has identified him as one of the 100 smartest people in New York. I could have picked that from string field theory. The, he has a BS from Harvard, a PhD from the University of California at Berkeley. He has published numerous scientific papers and books and is an expert in his field. However, the point that to me really steps out is he has gone beyond that cloistered scientific community that many of us in academe reside in, and that is the community of our peers to take information out to force people in large groups to think about science and to think about how science integrates into your life and how science and you are going to move forward into the future. Now, I got back from China on Friday. How many futurists 50 years ago would have said that the world's fastest growing economy that 80% of the concrete being poured in the world today would be poured in and the most rapid social and economic change in the world is occurring in China. There are very few people who would have. So as you hear the, the presentation tonight, I'd like you to think and, and apply this vision as you move forward in your lives. Um, at this time, I'd like to introduce Professor Michio Kaku. Well, after such a great introduction, I can't wait to hear the speaker myself. <laughs> First of all, it's true that New York Magazine voted me as one of the 100 smartest people. However, in all fairness, in all fairness, I have to admit that Madonna also made that same list. <laughs> and I think next year, I think Lady Gaga will push me off the list. Today, I'm going to talk about the next 100 years. I've had the privilege of interviewing over 300 of the world's top scientists for BBC Television, the Discovery Channel, the Science Channel, and my own national radio show, which broadcasts in 130 cities across the country. But predicting the future is dangerous. Let me quote from that great philosopher of the Western world. Yogi Berra. Yogi Berra once said, quote, prediction is awfully hard to do, especially if it's about the future. Well, I'm a physicist. We can predict billions of years into the future of our universe. Let me now quote from that other great philosopher of the Western world, Woody Allen. Woody Allen once said, quote, eternity is an awful long time, especially toward the end. Well, I'm a physicist. We invented the laser. We invented the transistor. We created the first computer. We wrote the World Wide Web. We also invented television. We invented radio, radar. We created microwave ovens. We created MRI machines. 
We created PET scans. We also created the atomic bomb. Well, when one physicist helped to create the internet, he made a prediction. He predicted that the internet would become a forum of high culture, high art, and high society. Well, today we know that 5% of the internet is pornography. But that's because teenage boys log on to the internet. Just wait until the grandmas and grandpas log on to the internet, then 50% of the internet will be pornography. <laughs> and before I begin, let me also tell you the, the danger of perhaps knowing a little bit too much. Let me tell you a story. Over 200 years ago, we had the great French Revolution. And one day, there were three gentlemen about to lose their head to the guillotine. There was a priest, a lawyer, and a theoretical physicist, just like me, about to have our heads chopped off. Well, they put the priest's head on the chopping block. And they asked him, do you have any last words before we slice your head off? And the priest said, yes. He said, God. God from above, he shall set me free. Well, all eyes were on the blade. They raised the blade. The blade came down, swish, and stopped right before it hit the neck of the priest. Well, the mob had never seen this before. So they said, let the priest go, because today God has spoken. And now let's see about the lawyer. Yes, the lawyer. They put the lawyer's head on the chopping block. And they asked him, do you have any last words? And he said, yes. He said, maybe the spirit of justice, justice shall set me free. All eyes were on the blade. They raised the blade. The blade came down, swish, and stopped right before it hit the neck of the lawyer. Well, this time the crowd went crazy. There was dancing in the streets of Paris. Let there be a national holiday. God has spoken today. Justice has spoken. And now let's see about that theoretical physicist. Well, they put the physicist's head on the chopping block. And they asked him, do you have any last words? And he said, yeah, yeah, I got some last words. And he said, you know, I don't know too much about God. And I know even less about the law. But I do know one thing. If you look up, you'll see that the rope is stuck on the pulley. <laughs> and then he said, if you remove the rope, the blade should come down real good. Big mistake. <laughs> Big mistake. Well, the rope came down, the blade came down, and the poor physicist's head came down. And it just goes to show you that sometimes we physicists have to know when to keep our mouths shut. <laughs> Nonetheless, let us open the mouths of 300 of the world's top scientists who are inventing the future in their laboratory. My first New York Times bestseller was Physics of the Impossible. My current book, Physics of the Future, is also on the New York Times bestseller list. This is now a TV program on the Science Channel, Sci-Fi Science, teleportation, telepathy, even, even psychokinesis and time travel we talk about in this TV program. You know that today we can teleport atoms, we can zap them right across the room, just like in Star Trek. Which leads us to a question. If you can teleport Captain Kirk, then who is this imposter over there? This imposter has the same personality, the same memories as Captain Kirk, and he even sells Priceline. Who is this imposter? Well, let's now talk about the information revolution. Let's talk about the next 20 years, 10, 20 years, and how you are going to be affected. This is Moore's Law. It is perhaps the most important law in modern history. Trillions of dollars of the economy depend on one curve. The wealth of nations depends on one curve. This curve simply says the computer power doubles every 18 months. Look at this. On a log chart, a straight line. This means that when you get a birthday card, and it sings, happy birthday to you, when you open it up, 
there's a chip in that birthday card. That chip has more computer power than all the Allied forces of 1945. Hitler, Stalin, Churchill would have killed to get that chip. And what do you do with it? You throw it away in the garbage. Your cell phone today, according to that curve, has more computer power than all of NASA in 1969 when it put two men on the moon. You know, when I see these old NASA tapes, they showed the control panel as they guided the space capsule. Those are 64K processors. Dinosaurs. I wouldn't get into that space capsule being backed up by 64K processors. No way I'm going to be shot into outer space like that. But that's how we did it in the old days. This curve also says that by 2020, in 10 years, computer chips will cost about a penny. That's cheaper than scrap paper. That's cheaper than bubblegum wrappers. That means that computer chips will go the way of electricity. Where is electricity today? It is everywhere and nowhere. It's in the, it's in the ceiling. Electricity is in the floor. It's in the walls. We don't even think about it anymore. Electricity is almost for free. That's the future of, a, of the computer. The word computer will eventually disappear from the English language. We will no longer say computer, just like we no longer say electricity. So what happens when computers are everywhere and nowhere, and they cost a penny? Well, every decade, this Moore's Law has created a revolution. In the 60s, we had huge mainframe computers the size of a room. Only the military and banks could afford them. In the 70s, many computers about the size of this podium. In the 80s, we had the PC. In the 90s, we had the internet. In 2000, we had ubiquitous computing. Chips go everywhere. When you put a chip into a typewriter, it becomes a word processor. When you put a chip into a telephone, it becomes an iPhone. When you put a chip into a TV set, it becomes the internet. Next decade, advanced sensors we'll talk about today. And even beyond that, mind control, mental control over computers. So the internet will be everywhere and nowhere. The magic mirror. So where will the internet be? Everywhere, including your glasses. These glasses are fully internet capable. They also recognize people's faces. How many times have you bumped into somebody and you say to yourself, who is this person? Jim, John, Jake, I know this person. Who is this person? In the future, your glasses will say, it's Jim, stupid. <laughs> How many times do I have to remind you? This is the third time this year you've bumped into Jim. Let's say you graduate from this college. You're at a cocktail party. You're looking for a job. You don't know who the important people are. You don't know who the heavy hitters are. In the future, you will know exactly who to suck up to at any cocktail party. <laughs> but let's say you don't want to look like a refugee from Star Trek. <laughs> Children will demand internet everywhere, including their glasses. These glasses also recognize not only people's faces, it prints out your biography next to your image. So you will see a person's face, the biography, and if they speak Chinese to you, you'll see subtitles in English translating Chinese into English. Internet glasses will be beamed right into the retina of your eye. Eventually, fashion models will wear them. It'll be fashionable to have the internet in your glasses. And this is, the, this is the future of your home office. Let's say you're at the beach and your boss wants to contact you. Your glasses ring, ring, ring. You pick up your glasses and say hello. And it's your home office, emergency meeting at the home office. You say, no problem. Simply download the meeting to the beach, and I will teleconference from the beach. Now, there's a problem. Let's say you don't wear glasses. 
Let's say you don't like glasses. Then what are you going to do? No problem. We will put them in your contact lens. And who are the first people to buy internet contact lenses? Students studying for final examinations. <laughs> you will blink and you will see all the answers to the final exams in your contact lens. Who else will buy these things? President Barack Obama. He doesn't have to have those dumb teleprompters anymore. All the lines will be inside his contact lens. Who else will buy these things? Actors and actresses. They will no longer flub their lines. You will no longer flub their lines because you'll see all the lines inside your contact lens. Who else will buy these things? Tourists. If you go to China and you go to the Summer Palace, it's all destroyed. There's nothing left of the Summer Palace outside Beijing because it was destroyed by French and British troops around 1860. No problem. The Chinese have totally animated the entire Summer Palace. As you walk through it, you see the Summer Palace as it was in 1860. In the future, it'll be shot into your contact lens. As you walk through the streets of Rome, you will see the entire Roman Empire resurrected in your contact lens as you walk through. Who else will buy these things? The military. Let's not be stupid. The army is one of the first to jump on this bandwagon. I took a film crew from Science Channel, flew down to Fort Benning, Georgia, and I had a demonstration of the military's version of this technology. You put on a helmet. Next to the helmet is a tiny visor. You flick it down, and immediately you see the internet of the battlefield. Enemy forces, friendly forces, artillery, aircraft, all of it right inside your eyeball. Who else will buy these things? Artists. Artists will wave their hand and create gorgeous works of art. Who else will buy these things? Architects. Architects will be able to move towers of their apartment complex just by waving their hands. In other words, the universe will be inside your contact lens. The internet will be everywhere and nowhere. Now you've seen this before. This is called augmented reality. Children like virtual reality where everything is a cartoon. Augmented reality is when you impose reality on top, computer reality on top of real reality. You've seen this before. In what movie have you seen this before? This is the former governor of California <laughs> in a very bad mood. The movie is The Terminator. On the upper left, when a Terminator sees something, it's in augmented reality. This is how you will live. You will access exam questions, enemy positions, the, the position of your car, art, works of art, lines of a movie script inside your contact lens. So in the future, the internet will be everywhere and nowhere. On the right is the internet in your wristwatch. On the left is the future of your cell phone. Now, you know that your cell phone can do internet now, but if you have fat fingers, forget it. There's no way you can type on a cell phone. In the future, you will scroll out paper, e-paper, intelligent paper, which only cost a penny, and you will scroll out the entire computer screen. This is the future of your cell phone. Not only will you use your cell phone for GPS, TV, communications, you'll also scroll out as big a screen as you want. And this is the future of wallpaper on the right. Paper will be intelligent and it will cost a penny. That's Moore's law. Today, if you don't like your wallpaper, tough. You just suffer. In the future, you go to the wallpaper and say, wallpaper, change color for me, change pattern. And the wallpaper instantly changes because computers are for free. On the upper left is your wallet. Instead of simply being stationary, it moves. Chips will be everywhere. In fact, your children 
will come up to you and say, Mommy, Daddy, how could you possibly live in a world where everything was dumb? Paper was just paper. Things just stood there acting stupid. How can you possibly live like that? Well, that's the present day world. And in the future, as I said before, we will access intelligence everywhere. This is your living room of the future. It is 360 degree paneling all around. You will look around and you will see paneling. This is also the future of your love life. Let's say it's Friday night and you have no date. What do you do? Come on, fess up, what do you do? You get stone drunk, right? In the future, you'll go to your wall screen and you'll say, mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's available tonight? <laughs> your wall screen already knows the kind of person you like, scans all the other wall screens on Friday night, and sets you up for a date. After the date, you say to your wall screen, mirror, mirror on the wall. I want to see Casablanca with my date, except Remove Humphrey Bogart's face and put my face instead. <laughs> Chips will be everywhere, including toys. Toys at Christmas are becoming increasingly smart. This is creating a problem for the English language, a contradiction in terms called smart Barbie dolls. That's a contradiction in terms. Another contradiction in terms is Microsoft works. That is also a contradiction in terms. That dog on the lower left is a cyber dog. It doesn't really exist, but it runs, plays, barks. It actually babysits your children, entertains your kids. That dog on the left will do everything except pee in the carpet. Now, this 360 degree paneling is connected to your head, knows the location of your head. So as you move your head, the whole TV screen moves with you. I had a demonstration of this. I took a film crew down to Maryland, University of Maryland, and we filmed inside a 360 degree chamber. We put dinosaurs on 360 degrees. Everywhere you look, you saw a panorama of dinosaurs and they put me on top of a T-Rex. So I was on top of a T-Rex hunting other dinosaurs, and as I moved my head, everything moved with me. That's the future. 360 degree total immersion. This is also called the matrix. Now, when the internet was first created, it was male dominated. It was about defeating the Soviet Union in a nuclear war. It was male, it was hierarchical. Today, the internet is female. It's basically about touching people. It's about reaching out and touching people. You know, in the old days, just 10 years ago, if you go to a nursing home, it was very sad. All these old people left to die by themselves. Children never visited them. All lonely, that's a nursing home. Today, you visit a nursing home, people are wired up. Old people on the internet playing bridge with somebody from Russia, somebody from South Africa, from the, some, from the South Pole. Hobbyists meeting other hobbyists on the internet. The internet is female. It's about touching people. And this is your living room of the future with your TV set. TV sets will have 3D without glasses. Now how does that work? No clunky glasses. This TV screen on the right consists of thousands of vertical lines, invisible vertical lines. Each vertical line is a prism that shoots the image, one to your left eye, one to your right eye, and that's how you get 3D without glasses. On the left is the future of glass. Even glass will become transparent. These are computer screens made out of transparent glass Today, if you pay a fortune for an apartment in Manhattan, your window may look over the city dump. Sorry about that. In the future, you'll simply go to the window and say, mirror, mirror on the wall. I want to see the Eiffel Tower. I want to see the Taj Mahal. Bingo, your glass changes. This is your office of the future. 
chips only cost a penny. So you'll scribble on these disposable computers and then throw them away. They only cost a penny. But as you move from room to room, the files move with you. Your files move in the cloud. As you go from room to room, room to house, house to car, car to vacation, vacation to office, all your files follow you because the computers are nothing. Today, your office is built around a PC. Why? Why should your office be built around a PC? In the future, the files are important. The computer is nothing. You just throw them away. This is your cubicle of the future. It'll be so beautiful, you'll never get any work done. This is your car of the future. Google is spending millions of dollars perfecting this in eight years' time. In eight years, you will have a car that drives itself. It has GPS, it has radar in the fender, and it drives all by itself. I had a chance to drive this car in North Carolina. I flew down there with BBC television. I got in this car, and there I was driving the car. And then the cameraman said, let go of the steering wheel. And I said, what? He said, let go of the steering wheel. So I closed my eyes, and I went like this. And the car drove itself. The car actually started to maneuver all by itself. Now tonight, after this talk, when you drive home, try driving home like this. <laughs> this is how you will drive in the future. You'll simply talk to the car, the words traffic accident will disappear from the English language. This car is actually safer than a human. Humans get drunk. Humans fall asleep. Humans have road rage. Computers do not know what road rage means. And this is how you will shop in the future. This contains your three-dimensional measurements on your credit card. Today, if you go to a dress store and you see the perfect dress, right fashion, right color, everything is perfect, except it's the wrong size. What happens? No sale. In the future, you'll put your credit card into the machine. Machine will scan, punch out a beautiful dress, and mail it to you. It'll be a perfect fit every time, and then it'll send you the bill. This is called mass customization. In the future, you will buy things as specially customized objects. Today, that's too expensive. In the future, you will have mass customization because of computers. And how will you shop in the future? This is a cell phone that scans barcodes and tells you who has the cheapest product in a store. This is called perfect capitalism when you know exactly how much things cost. In the future, when you go into a department store, your contact lens will scan all the chips that have replaced the barcode and tell you exactly what things really cost. What do things really cost anyway? Who's making a profit? How much, who has the cheapest? In the future, you walk into a store and your contact lens will scan all the chips and tell you who has the cheapest, best product. This is called perfect capitalism when you have perfect knowledge inside your contact lens. Now let's say a few things about medicine. That's just the future of computers. The future of computers is to disappear, to be woven into the fabric of life. We will talk to them, they will talk to us. Now let's see a few things about the biotech revolution. On the left is the movie Fantastic Voyage starring Raquel Welch. The critics hated it because all they did with Raquel Welch was they miniaturized her down to the sides of a cell and shot her into the bloodstream. What a waste. Well, in the future, we will have the fantastic voyage. So let's now first ask a question. How tiny can you make a chip? That's a physics question. How tiny can you make a chip? This chip is so small, you can put it in an aspirin pill with a TV camera. The TV camera takes photographs of your insides and has a magnet. You can guide this pill with a magnet. And we all know what middle-aged men fear the most, the C word, colonoscopy. Well, this gives new meaning for the expression, Intel inside. 
That's the future of Intel to be inside. And how small can you make a chip? Believe it or not, we physicists have taken a molecule, a molecule, get this, a molecule, put chemotherapy poisons on the molecule, homed it on a cancer cell, and killed it. This is big. This is real big. This is going to replace chemotherapy. You know, if you have chemotherapy today, your hair falls out, you vomit, you feel awful. You feel like dying going under, under chemotherapy. That's because chemotherapy is like a shotgun. This is a rifle. It already exists. 90% effective in one clinical trial. Molecules that home in on individual cancer cells. I tell you, man, this is really big. But then you might ask a question, what about before cancer forms? What about diagnosing cancer years before it forms? Ladies and gentlemen, you're now looking at the basic cure for cancer. Your toilet. Your toilet will have a chip in it. Your toilet will have a chip in it shown here. It's called the DNA chip, made in Silicon Valley, so tiny that you can actually detect individual DNA molecules from cancer. This is really big. In the future, your toilet will tell you that you will get cancer in 10 years. You know, today, if you feel a lump in your breast, it's too late. It's really too late. They don't tell you this. But you have 10 billion cancer cells growing in your breast. Surgery is required immediately. In the future, your toilet, shown here, will detect fragments of DNA genes from cancer colonies of 100 cancer cells 10 years before a tumor forms. I tell you, man, this is really big. You know that Steve Jobs of Apple and Aretha Franklin, the singer, both of them are dying of pancreatic cancer. In textbooks, they say that pancreatic cancer kills you very rapidly in three or so years. Very aggressive, kills you in three years. Now we realize that's wrong. Pancreatic cancer, we sequenced it just a few months ago. We now realize that pancreatic cancer is very slow growing. It takes 20 years on average for pancreatic cancer to grow. 20 years. Only in the last three years do you feel it, and then it's too late. In the future, your toilet will tell you that you have pancreatic cancer. You have 20 years to do something about it, so get to it. Now, in Star Trek, we have something called the tricorder. It detects all sorts of diseases, looks inside your body. People laughed. Ha! How can you possibly make a tricorder like that? Well, on the left is an MRI machine. Huge, gigantic, weighs about five tons, takes up a whole room, and it looks inside your body. How small can you make an MRI machine? On the right is the world's smallest MRI machine. It is the size of a briefcase. And how small can we make it? It's made in Germany. The Germans claim that they can make an MRI machine the size of a cell phone. That is your tricorder. And we should also say that in the future, with medical costs ballooning, in the future, your doctor will be inside your wallpaper. You will go to the wall and say, mirror, mirror on the wall, I'm gonna see a doctor, I don't feel good. Boom, an animated image of a doctor appears on your wall. The doctor is a robot, looks human, talks human, answers 95% of all your common questions. This is RoboDoc. The future of medicine is your wallpaper. You will have a doctor in your wallpaper. Also, robo-lawyer. You will also have a lawyer in your wallpaper as well, answering 95% of all common legal questions. 
This will drastically reduce the cost of medical care in the United States, all because of your wallpaper. Now, going further into the future, we went 20 years into the future, now let's go 50 years into the future. 50 years from now, we will, we will control computers with the mind. You will think about it like an avatar, and it will come to pass. This is called telepathy, otherwise known as mind reading. This is a toy. The boy on the left puts on a helmet. That helmet picks up radio from the boy's brain, deciphers it, and then controls this toy on the right. This is the force. The force of Star Wars. We will control computers mentally. This is how it's done at Brown University, just a few miles from here. This gentleman on the right had a stroke, paralyzed, a vegetable. They put a chip in his brain, connected it to a laptop, and here he is. This person who is paralyzed, is a vegetable, can now communicate with a computer. He can now read email, write email, surf the web, play video games, do crossword puzzles, anything you can do, he can do on a computer, and he is paralyzed. One of my colleagues is Stephen Hawking, the cosmologist. He has lost control over his hands. He can only blink now and grimace. That's all he can do. In the future, there is talk that maybe we'll put my colleague Stephen Hawking on a computer so he can talk directly through a computer. This is Japan now. In Japan, they took this gentleman here, put EEG sensors, which pick up radio signals from the brain, and hooked him up to a robot. This is Avatar. We will have the ability to control avatars, like Asimo on the right, mentally using the power of pure thought. And what else can we do with these MRI machines? We can also use them as lie detectors. On the left is your brain when you tell the truth. When you tell the truth, nothing much happens. But when you tell a lie, first, you have to know the truth. Second, you have to create the lie. Third, you have to calculate the consistency of the lie with all the other lies you've been telling all these years. That's a lot of brain power. Your brain lights up like a Christmas tree. So there's your brain on the right telling a lie. And in the future, in Japan, they want to photograph a dream. This is now well within the possibility of physics. When you dream, you excite the memory centers of the visual center of the brain. We know exactly where that lights up. Using the MRI scans, we can now pick up images. Images, simple image, dogs, cats, simple things like that in the brain. We're getting that good. We're getting a dictionary. A dictionary that translates dog, cat, house into brain patterns. So in the future, when you dream about a dog or a cat or a house, we'll pick it up and we'll tell you what you've been dreaming about. Now let's say a few things about personal genomics. In the future, when you go to the doctor's office, all of us will have a credit card with all our genes on it. Today, to sequence your genes costs $50,000. That's the cost to sequence your genes. This year, scientists are going to market a machine commercially that costs $50,000 and will sequence hundreds of other genes. Eventually, we're going to have the $1,000 genome in just a few years, and after that, the $100 genome. All your genes will be sequenced on a chip and you will have it. And what are we gonna do with it? Well, among other things, we're gonna create body organs. This is an ear. It is made out of plastic. It's a sponge-like material. We seed it from ear cells from your ear, not someone else's ear, your ear. We seed it with cells from your ear, and then we let it grow. We hit it with growth factors, it grows into the ear, and then the plastic dissolves, leaving a perfect ear. This is bone on the left, ears on the right. 
We can now grow from your own cells. We can grow skin, bone, cartilage, noses, ears, blood vessels. The first bladder was grown four years ago. It actually works, a complete bladder. And the first windpipe was grown last year. The next organ to be grown is the liver in about five years' time. So for you alcoholics in the audience, there's hope. There's hope for you alcoholics because we will grow livers in the body, of the body in just a few years' time. It's estimated that in five years, I mean in 20 years, I'm sorry, 20 years, we'll probably grow every single organ of the body except the brain. The brain is a little bit difficult because it contains all that information. But most other organs of the body, we will grow. Now, can we have the video? There's a video of the next 50 years that I hosted for the Discovery Channel. And after the video, I'm going to be building up to a point. What will civilization itself look like in 100 years? But let's have the video. We're going to visit a doctor's office 50 years from now in the video. In a world where machines interact like people and bodies can be rebuilt from scratch, how will we wage war, fuel our need for power, commute to space? What life-saving innovations will be possible in the next 50 years? Flying ambulances and intelligent clothing. Brain chips cure paralysis. Vital organs printed to order. See how scientists today are making visions of tomorrow real. Physicist and futurist Michio Kaku will guide you through the medical breakthroughs that will change your life. The future is closer than you think. It all starts now with the body. 50 years from now, you'll live in an intelligent house. You can program sensors to monitor your body and keep you healthy, yet guard your privacy. Caution. Alcohol level. Because any information you reveal could come back to haunt you. Let's keep this between us. Computer chips connect you to the entire city including your insurance company. The good news is you'll live a lot longer because an agent gives you a remote physical every three days. The bad news? You'll have no secrets. Wait, a mucous membrane of the mouth? Send health memo immediately. Bonjour, Monsieur Degas. Here are a few more tips for your dental care. Brush your teeth regularly using the ultrasound toothbrush. You should give away the fact that Alan was partying last night and his premiums will go up as a result. Thanks for your attention. You must be joking. Get the car, please. Alan's clothing looks quite ordinary, but that's deceptive because woven inside the fabric are dozens of tiny computer chips and sensors monitoring his health. When he puts on his clothing, he goes online. Now get this. If he's ever knocked unconscious, his clothes will automatically identify his coordinates, alert the authorities, and upload his entire medical history before the ambulance arrives. In the future, you will have a doctor in your clothing. When you have a severe accident, brain cells can die within six minutes. The ambulance of tomorrow will not only reach you in time, it will carry a medical revolution that can save your life. Patient data registered. Alain Dega. Platinum class confirmed. Loss of blood, 35%. I suggest reversible death. Okay. After a severe accident or heart attack, every second brings us closer to death. So wouldn't it be great if one day we could somehow stop the clock? 
In the future, EMT crews could use a technique called reversible death or suspended animation. They will replace your blood with an ice-cold saline solution, dropping your body temperature to below 50 degrees Fahrenheit. At that point, brain and heart activity come to a halt. And that's not the only blood substitute that one day could save your life. 50 years from now, we'll have cures for trauma victims that would seem like miracles today. Your left thigh has been fractured and your hip is dislocated. Two ribs and a second lumbar vertebra are also fractured, but you have a bigger problem. Your artificial heart has fissures. You're going to open me up? You need a new heart. The print's already in progress. It'll only take another 20 hours. Iris scan identified. Marie Balzac. Status cleared for security zone. Have a nice evening. In this high security area, Gene specialists have processed the patient's tissue sample. Now they are using it to print a heart. If your car gets banged up because you're in a car accident, what do you do? You go to the body shop and get a new door or fender. But if you happen to be in that same accident, you could die. Now consider this. In the United States alone, there are 91,000 patients waiting for an organ transplant. And of them, 18 die every day for an organ that never comes. What we need is a human body shop. And in 50 years time, tissue engineering could change everything. A child today with a defective heart valve has limited options. Valves from animals don't last long, and artificial valves can cause clots. Stephen Jakenhuvel wants to avoid these problems by implanting the world's first heart valve grown exclusively from the body's own tissue. Within an hour, he has the rough form of a heart valve, which he places in a bioreactor. Next, he adds nutrients and cells which normally line heart valve walls. The cells latch onto the structure and start to grow. Within just three weeks, a complete heart valve has formed. Finally, a pump exercises the valve to strengthen its walls so it can withstand the high pressures in a human heart. Patient hypotherm. During surgery, doctors won't have to touch the patient. Body temperature 46 degrees. Blood completely replaced with plasma solution. Instead, surgeons will manipulate a 3D model of the body. These virtual images will revolutionize surgery in the next decades. With a click, doctors can switch from a scalpel to a saw. They open the thorax virtually, while robotic arms perform the actual incisions. Are all the main arteries blocked? Yes, you can remove the organ. Now, if you think that was amazing, just wait till we talk about the next frontier, the aging process. Do you realize that for the first time in human history, we're now beginning to unravel some of the genes, the genes that control the aging process? And so the question is, do we have to age? Well, it turns out that some animals don't age at all. Crocodiles, alligators, flounders, they apparently live forever. Now you may say to yourself, now wait a minute. I saw a book where it said that alligators only live to be the age of 70. Well, that's because the zookeeper died at age 70. 
Alligators and crocodiles, they just keep on going. We have never, ever seen crocodiles or alligators die of old age. They simply get bigger. Now, in the wild, eventually they die of starvation, disease, accidents. But in zoos, they live forever. So if crocodiles and alligators can do it, why can't us? Well, it turns out that we're now beginning to tease apart the molecular basis of the aging process. It turns out if you take an animal and feed it 30% less calories, it lives 30% longer. Yeast cells, spiders, worms, insects, rabbits, dogs, cats, and now monkeys. You feed them 30% less, they live 30% longer. Now, who wants to live like that? We have now found the gene, or a gene, SIR2, that seems to regulate that process, also telomeres. So we're now beginning to tease apart for the first time the aging process. We don't have it yet. Don't believe it if someone claims to have the fountain of youth. That's nonsense. But it's well within our capability. Perhaps your grandchildren, when they hit the age of 30, they may decide to stop. They may decide they like 30, and they want to be age 30 for the next 30, 40, 50 years. That is a possibility. And now let me end on a note. Where are we going with all this technology? In the future, we're all going to get wired. We'll all live longer. We'll have uh, organ failure. We'll never die of organ failure anymore. Where are we headed? We are headed toward what is called a type 1 civilization. We physicists, when we explore outer space, we don't talk about little green men. We talk about type 1 type two and type three civilizations. A type one civilization is planetary. They control the weather. They control the oceans, hurricanes, tornadoes, volcanoes, they control. They even have mined the asteroid belt. That's called a type one civilization, a planetary civilization, a civilization sort of like Buck Rogers or Flash Gordon. And then the question is, a type one civilization, will it have wars? Well, yes, but think about it this way. In the future, the internet spreads democracy. And democracies never war with each other. Think about it. Think of every war you've ever learned about since you were in grade school. Wars from the Bible. Wars from the Roman Empire, World War I, World War II. They've always been between dictatorships, monarchies, kings, queens, never between two democracies. So the point I'm raising is the internet spreads democracy. And as the internet spreads democracy, as we go toward a type one civilization, the fires of war, we will always have them, but the fires of war will be lessened because democracies never war with other democracies. Well, we'll talk about physical wars for the moment, okay? Now the transition from type zero to type one is not guaranteed. We are a type zero civilization. We get our energy from dead plants, oil and coal. But you can see the beginning of a type one telephone system. The internet, the internet, is a type one telephone system. We're privileged to be alive to see a type one technology literally be born right in front of us. Planetary language is emerging on the internet. Already there are two languages emerging on the internet, English and Mandarin, Chinese. The European Union is the beginning of a planetary economy of some sorts, off to a rocky start. We see the beginning of a youth culture, rock and roll, movies, planetary sports, Olympics, soccer, even planetary high fashion, Chanel, Gucci. Wherever you go, you see the beginnings of a type one planetary civilization. But it's not guaranteed. The transition from type zero to type one is not guaranteed. We still have all the savagery of our type zero origins. But let's move on. Type two. A type two civilization uses the power of a star, like Star Trek. They can control the entire output of a star. 
They are immortal. Nothing known to science can destroy a type two civilization. Meteors, comets can be deflected. Ice ages can be delayed. Even the death of their sun. They can either move their planet or reignite their sun. So a type two civilization would be like the Federation of Planets or Star Trek. Then we have type three. A type three civilization controls the power of an entire galaxy, like the empire of the Star Wars saga. So the point I'm raising is that in about a hundred years, in about the year 2100, we will be a type one civilization. And what is a type one civilization? It is scientific, prosperous, multicultural, and diverse. That is where we are headed. Now, there's some people who don't like this. There's some people who don't like to have a prosperous, scientific, multicultural, and diverse society. Among them, terrorists. Terrorists feel comfortable not in the 21st century; they feel more comfortable in the 9th century. But the point is that we are moving toward Type One. It's not guaranteed. There could be nuclear war, bioterrorism, what have you. But we're moving toward a Type One civilization. Now, by the time we're Type Three, in about a hundred thousand years, Type Three, at that point, perhaps even space and time may be warped. Perhaps we'll be able to control gateways to other universes. We physicists believe that there is a multiverse of universes, and perhaps we'll be able to move between even universes to create baby universes in the laboratory. This is something that we're looking at seriously now. The question is, can we make even baby universes in the laboratory? Well, I gave this lecture in London a few years ago, and a little boy came up to me. About age of ten, he was tugging on my pants, pest, <laughs> and he kept saying, "He kept saying, Professor, you're wrong. There's type four." So I looked down at this pesky kid, and I said to him, "Shut up, kid. <laughs> Why don't you go play in traffic?" There's a nice intersection over there, <laughs> and he kept pulling on my pants. He said, "Professor, you're wrong. There's type four." And I said, "Look, kid, in the universe we have planets, stars, and galaxies. That's it. Therefore, we only have type one, type two, and type three civilizations. That's it." And the kid kept saying, "You're wrong." This type four, the power of the continuum. Now, for you Star Trek fans out there, let me ask you a quiz question: How many people can identify the only type four civilization on network television? The Q. Ten points over there. <laughs> Now, if you did not understand what just transpired, get with the program. <laughs> It's on every Tuesday night. Okay. So maybe there's even a type four civilization that can literally play with entire universes. But the point I'm raising is we are headed for our destiny. Our destiny is to become type one. We are about a hundred years away from being a type one civilization already. You can see the beginnings of a type one civilization, a civilization that is scientific, prosperous, multicultural, and diverse. Well, let me also say that many of the technologies I talked about today were made possible by Einstein, and my favorite Einstein story is this: When Einstein was an old man, he was tired of giving the same talk over and over again. So one day, his chauffeur came up to him, and he said, "Professor, I'm really a part-time actor. I've heard your speech so many times; I've memorized it like a script." So why don't we switch places? I will put on a mustache. I will put on a wig. I'll be the great Einstein, and you can be my chauffeur. Well, Einstein loved the joke, so they switched places. This went along famously. The actor gave great talks until one day, a mathematician in the back asked a very difficult question, 
And Einstein thought, oh, the game is up. But then the chauffeur said, that question is so elementary that even my chauffeur here can answer it for you. <laughs> Thank you very much. You've been a great audience. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think we have time for a few questions. So if you have a few questions, I guess you can uh, maybe come up to the mic or... Hi, I'm Karen Suvari. I'm from the Student Entertainment Committee. I'm the current president of the Speakers Committee. And we're very pleased to co-sponsor this event tonight. I'm glad you're all here. Um, the Student Entertainment Committee's goal is to educate and entertain the students. And in the past, we've brought a variety of diverse events and also uh, co-sponsored for other um, organizations on campus. Um, in the past, we've brought Robert Kennedy Jr., movie director Kevin Smith, the cast of Mythbusters, actor Michael Emerson from Lost, fashion designers from Project Runway, and businessmen Ben and Jerry, along with other athletes, actors, and politicians. I just wanted to take a moment to tell you about our upcoming events. We have a fall festival planned. The first event is on Sunday, October 23rd. Uh, we have Max Brooks, zombie expert, coming um, right here in Edwards. So he's the... Um, author of New York Times bestseller uh, book, uh, Zombie Books. Our other upcoming events include Girl, the Girl Talk concert, comedian Aziz Ansari, and Dana Carvey for our family weekend event. Thank you all for coming, and we'll open the floor up for, uh, for some questions. And you can form lines right here downstage at the microphones. Okay, we, do we have any questions? Hello? Oh, good, it's on. Um, this, this is more of a, a physics question than a, a future question, but um, recently, I, I'm sure a lot of people have seen this in the news, some researchers at CERN have said they've, they've measured something, some particles they've measured moving faster than the speed of light. Do you... Do you think that's going to pan out at all? or? Okay, the question is, just last week, it was announced at CERN, Switzerland, where they have the world's largest particle accelerator, that maybe Einstein was wrong. They found particles called neutrinos that broke the light barrier, that went faster than the speed of light. Well, as you can imagine, we physicists had a heart attack after that announcement was made. Most of us broke out in a cold sweat because it means that if this result holds up, every single goddamn physics book in the world has to be rewritten. <laughs> Everything has to be thrown out the window. Lasers, transistors, the GPS system, the internet, most of what we call modern technology has to be recalibrated, readjusted to account for this new fact. Now, personally, I think that this result is wrong. Okay, I'll tell you why. In 1987, we also had a beam of neutrinos that hit the Earth. There was a supernova that blew up in the Magellanic clouds, roughly, what, 50,000 light years from here, a good healthy distance, about 50,000 light years from the Earth. The light and the neutrinos hit the Earth at the same time. As soon as we saw the supernova, we registered neutrino detectors buzzing like crazy, meaning that both hit the Earth at the same time, over a distance of thousands of light years. Now, this result was between Switzerland and Italy, a distance of 400 miles. And the neutrino beam outraced the light beam by 60 feet. I find that hard to believe that in 1987, we can measure the simultaneity of neutrinos and light beam over thousands of light years. And then between Switzerland and Italy, they find a discrepancy. What's the problem? Well, first of all, how do you measure the distance between Switzerland and Italy? You have to use a GPS system. But the GPS system is relativistic. 
You have to use Einstein's theory to use a GPS system. So they're using Einstein's theory to dispute Einstein's theory. There's got to be something circular there, okay? So I can't prove it. Science, of course, has no sacred cows. You are only as good as your last experiment. One experiment can disprove Einstein. Now, during the 1930s, the Nazi party denounced relativity, and the Nazi party even issued a book called 100 Authorities Denounce Relativity. People interviewed Einstein. What do you think about this? 100 famous German intellectuals denounce Einstein. And he was quoted. And Einstein said, if you want to destroy relativity, you don't need 100 famous people. You only need one experiment. This could be that experiment, but I don't think so. Okay? You have to have a lot of nerve to go up against Einstein. Okay, next question. How's it going? Um, quick question. It's not really a big deal like the last one, but uh, <laughs> um, you talked about uh, 3D without glasses. Mm -hmm. um, would you be able to see that if you only had one eye? <laughs> okay, the question is, when we have 3D without glasses, can you see 3D with only one eye? And the answer is no. <laughs> Sorry about that. The reason is, you know in novelty shops, when you go by a novelty shop, they have pictures of like Jesus Christ, and then when you move your head, Jesus Christ blinks. And as you keep on moving, he blinks and blinks and blinks. You've seen these things, right? Novelty shops as you go past a picture. This is called lenticular technology. You take two pictures, one of Jesus Christ with his eyes closed, another one with Jesus Christ with his eyes open, and then you have vertical lines that shoot the image in different ways, splits the image in half. So these 3D television sets is nothing but a very sophisticated version of this lenticular technology. It shoots one image to your left eye, and one image to your right eye, giving you the illusion of two dimensions. If you have only one eye, you only see one image. Sorry about that. You're out of luck. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Konkuno. I really uh, appreciate everything that you've um, done for the evening, and you know, and also, you know, giving us your, you know, wonderful. I can't, I don't even have words for it, but it's really amazing, you know. <coughs> My question, however, is um, with all the techno technological advances we've had, we've had some immediate benefits, but sometimes we've had some long-term negative consequences as a result of technological advances. Do you think in the future, um, or even in the near future, that you know, our technology and our people thinking of technological advances will be able to minimize or eradicate negative consequences? I think we will always have some negative consequences to every technology. When electricity was first harnessed by Thomas Edison over 100 years ago, he wired up Pearl Street in Manhattan. That was the world's first street in the world to be electrified. There was a controversy. Many people wrote editorials denouncing Edison by saying, first of all, when electricity is placed in your living room, people will get electrocuted. Well, you know what happened? They were. <laughs> people get electrocuted every day. Second, they said, houses will burn down. And you know what happened? They did too. <laughs> houses burn down every day because of electricity. So the critics were absolutely right. People did get electrocuted. Houses did burn down, but we love it. <laughs> because electricity, the benefits are infinite compared to a few people who hook up their, you know, in, their, their plugs incorrectly and burn down their house. Sorry about that, right? Now, when the telephone first came out, I looked it up, there were editorials denouncing Alexander Graham Bell and the telephone. They said, first of all, people are not going to talk to their, their loved ones at the dinner table anymore. They're going to talk to a wire and talk to this ether, this disembodied voice in the ether. Well, you know something? The critics were absolutely right. 
We do not talk so much to five people anymore. In the old days, all you talked to were five people. Now we talk to 500 people on the telephone, and you know something? We love it. So there's negatives to everything. And now with the internet, you can talk to five billion people, not just five people in your family. So there is pluses and minuses. And remember, look at the Middle East. The Middle East has been frozen for 50 years. Dictatorship, because of the Cold War, froze the Middle East for 50 years. And then in five months, Twitter overthrows several dictatorships, just in five months. That's the power of democracy, and that's what the internet is all about. Now, are we gonna have shut-ins? Are we gonna have people who spend all their time in a darkened room with the internet? Yes, we'll have that too. But the benefits, I think, far outweigh the negatives. Every technology, I think, will have a dark side. Thank you. This is about the Fermilab being shut down. Um, do you think that was the right decision to shut down the Fermilab um, and just replace it with CERN? Or do you think they should have kept it running? Yeah, as you know, um, Fermilab, our premier particle accelerator, is being shut down. All the effort now is going to Switzerland because of a brain drain. There's a bigger picture. America is losing the edge one by one. In 1993, Congress canceled the super collider. It was to be the center of physics. The Vatican of physics was could be, to be Dallas, Texas. A gigantic hole was dug in the ground costing a billion dollars given to us by Congress. Then in 1993, Congress canceled the super collider gave us a second billion dollars to fill up the hole. <laughs> Two billion dollars for a hole. To dig it and fill it. That's about the IQ of the Congress. Okay? <laughs> now, now, there's a brain drain to Europe. My friends are leaving. They're going to Europe because that's where the action is. We've lost it in physics. We're losing it in biology. Stem cell research. So many restrictions on federal grants for stem research. A lot of people here in this country are giving up and saying, I'm going to go to Europe. I'm going to go to Asia where they don't have restrictions on stem cell research. Look at the space program. That's gone. 17,000 engineers, 17,000 aerospace engineers we're the cream of the cream of our science. It's gone. It's going to be reduced down to 7,000. We're going to lose 10,000 of our top aerospace engineers. Next, fusion, energy. We're giving that to the French. The French are now going to be developing the world's first fusion reactor in 2019. In just eight years, they hope to have the first operational fusion plant. So it's sad to say, but one by one, we're losing it. We're losing it in physics. Now it's going to go to Switzerland. We're losing it in stem cell research. It's going to Europe. We're losing it in energy. Fusion will go to France. And um, the space program is going to the Chinese. Sorry about that. Thanks. Yeah. Hi. Um, with all this new technology, um, will the brain be able to input all this information? Will we be able to input all this information? Yeah, will we be able to handle it? Oh, well, realize that 100 years ago, if you were to look at what children learned 100 years ago, they had to memorize all this nonsense. Uh, a geometry test would be to learn all about the lattice rectum and how to trisect angles. Useless information that we don't need today. And 50 years ago, you had to learn how to use a slide roll. And no one uses slide rolls anymore. So we have to realize that a huge chunk of learning is a waste. Because learning is about concepts, principles, about why things do the way they, they are, not simply the data. Now, of course, you have to know some data, but a lot of it is not necessary. So I think as we have more information, the, everything will be in, the, in your eyeglasses or your contact lens. You're not going to have to memorize the names of the crystals, the names of the, uh, uh, the certain chemical elements. Just simply blink and see them in your, in your contact lens. So I think learning will focus instead on principles, on concepts, and how to make use of these principles and concepts rather than memorizing all the parts of a flower. So I think it's a good thing when the encyclopedia is for blinking. Oh, okay. 
Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Doctor. Um, I have two questions. One is about the quantum entanglement, and the other one is about the a question about quantum mechanics. Yeah. Entanglements. What? Oh, entanglement. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And also, why is that not used for communication, long distance communication yet? Um, or maybe it is. I'm not sure. Um, the other one is about the, something that I believe for about 20 years that there are uh, bucky tubes inside the brain cells, and that can be uh, just used to describe the uh, tell basically the uh, communication, like uh, hypnosis. I didn't quite understand that question, but let me answer the first part. There's something called quantum entanglement that even Einstein couldn't get his head around, but Einstein was wrong on this one. If I two, take two electrons, and they vibrate, and they vibrate in unison, and then I separate two electrons, an umbilical cord opens up connecting these two electrons. And then if I jiggle one, then the other one knows that its partner is being jiggled faster than the speed of light. You can actually go faster than the speed of light. So Einstein hated this experiment, but we've done it. We've done it in the laboratory, works out every time. So how come we don't throw out relativity? How come we don't use this to calculate across the stars? There's a catch. There's always a catch. When you have two electrons connected by an umbilical cord called entanglement, and you jiggle one, Information travels between them faster than the speed of light, but it is random information. It is useless. You cannot send Morse code this way. So it does travel faster than light, but Einstein has the last laugh. It is random information, and it has no practical use. So sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> One last question, and then we'll close it up, okay? One last question. Your talk tonight reminded me of some of the talks that people that's meant that scientists and academics like yourself would give a hundred years ago describing about what today would be like. And as it turned out, what they would say, were saying back then did not, did not happen. And one reason I'm saying this is because you did not go, into, go fully into the practical aspects of the techno this technology, particularly in medicine and finance. And I'm saying this, and this is leading to my question, because I'm one of the, I'm one of the members of the population who would not be able to benefit from these technological advances even if they were here today. I mean, when I, when earlier in your talk, you talked about the contact lenses and the glasses that would be able to link you up to the internet. Now, without my glasses, I'm legally blind. And if I had such glasses like the ones you described earlier, I would not be able to function. Now, two, now a few weeks ago, I was just down at the beach and I had a bee fly right into my eye. Now, if I had one of those smart contact lenses in my eyes, which would link me up to the internet, and if that bee had flown right into it, I would not have an eye. Now, and one... And when you described about in the future about everybody using credit, using cards for money, so now one reason now I cannot even use a credit card whatsoever because 19 years ago my fortune got wiped out by a bank that embezzled the money. Now, now for everyone to have a credit card would mean that everyone would have their money in a centralized location, which would make it more easier for somebody to steal the steal another person's for money. Now I was wanting to know. Well, what do you think of the more? Yes. What is your? What do you think of now? Now, this, all this technology sounds well and good, but what kind of safeguards would you think should be put in place before such technologies? I mean, technology is good, like you said. Electricity is good, tech, but okay, there need, but we need. Okay, let me try to answer just a few of the things that he raises. Okay, first of all, it is true that many predictions are wrong. People come up to me and they say, "Where's my flying car?" Where's my flying car? But I tell them, who, who, who made the prediction of flying cars? Cartoonists. Cartoonists with the Jetsons. Physicists never said that flying cars are easy. We know that flying cars are very expensive. They already exist. We can make a flying car. They're just very expensive. That video was when we can bring down the cost of an existing technology and have flying cars everywhere. So it was cartoonists who said we're going to have flying cars everywhere. Now, over 150 years ago, about that time, Jules Verne wrote two books predicting the next 100 years, and he got it almost exactly right. He rolled from the Earth to the Moon. He got the size of the capsule correct to within 10% accuracy. He said it would be launched from Florida to the Moon. He said it would take three days to reach the Moon. He said the splashdown would be in the ocean. Every single aspect was right. The only thing he got wrong was the propulsion system. And then he made an even bigger prediction. 
Jules Verne's greatest prediction was never published. He predicted Paris in the year 1960. The book was so preposterous, was so incredible, that the publisher could not publish it. No one would believe Jules Verne if he were to talk about Paris in 1960. And what was so preposterous, what was so crazy that Jules Verne was predicting in 1863? In 1863, what was long distance communication? It was yelling at your neighbor. <laughs> he predicted that we would have glass skyscrapers when most people lived in shacks. We would have gasoline-fired cars when most people had horses or just walked on foot. He predicted the fax machine, and he predicted the internet, something like the internet, in 1863. He got almost everything right. How? How did he do it? Because every time a scientist or engineer went through Paris, he would buttonhole them, pump them for all the information they had. He knew that science would be the engine that drove the future. And he got everything right because he talked to the scientists who were inventing the future in their laboratory. And that's what I've tried to do here. I've made hundreds of predictions in my book, Physics of the Future, each one backed up by a laboratory, each one backed up by a physicist or a chemist, people who really have working prototypes in the laboratory. Of course, we'll still make mistakes, but it is, I think, the best projection of the world that you are going to see in your lifetime. Thank you very much. You've been a great audience. Thank you.